We thank you, dear God, for allowing us to be here in the sanctuary this morning to worship you. As the lights illuminate and all the beautiful decoration for the Advent season. Thank you. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied exultations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. As people exult when dividing plunder for the yoke of their burden and in the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authorities rest upon his shoulder, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Great will be his authority, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time onward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as we take our Advent journey this year, through these four weeks between now and Christmas Eve, we are going to be exploring the heralding of the good news. At this time of year, heralding might be understood by many of us to be the job of angels, right? Hark the herald angels sing is a beloved Christmas hymn. Taken from the birth narrative in the Gospel of Luke, it's the angels who are the ones who announce or herald the good news to the shepherd. The good news of the birth of this long expected savior, the one who will bring change to their lives as individuals and as a community. But it's not just angels who herald good news. Anyone could be a herald of good news. Families herald good news when they send out birth announcements or wedding invitations, telling family and friends that their long-expected child has arrived or that a new son or daughter has been welcomed into the family. It's good news that's worth sharing, and so they are heralders of that good news. A coworker might rush into the office and tell everyone, good news, the boss is giving everyone a Christmas bonus this year. That's good news indeed and definitely worth sharing with your coworkers. The Miami Herald is a newspaper which provides news and information, some good and some not so good, of course to readers across the whole southern tip of Florida and beyond. Newspapers have their roots in the actions of town criers or heralds who came into the center of a community to herald the good news or just the news of the day before everyone could read on their own, before there were newspapers that were regularly printed for daily news. Today, we begin with the good news heralded to the people of Israel through the words of the prophet Isaiah. In the coming weeks, we are going to pay attention to the good news to the town of Bethlehem, the good news to Mary, and the good news to the shepherds 
through angel voices. Each week, we're going to ask of the ancient texts that we read, what is the good news for the initial audience, and what is the good news for us? If you join us on Facebook or Instagram or on our new HRPC Advent WhatsApp group, you can still sign up for that with Ruth today if you would like to be included. You're going to find all kinds of examples of good news every week during Advent. In the actions of Presbyterians around the world, through music and through art, as well as through good news found in secular news sources. Even if you have been not a person who makes use of these communication vehicles, I encourage you that you might decide to try one for Advent as a spiritual practice. You might hear some good news heralded to you in a new and different way that you don't usually participate in. But if you're totally uncomfortable with social media and can't stand the thought of even trying it for four weeks during Advent, then look for a printed guide in the mail that will be mailed to your home each week during Advent with good news. And if you haven't gotten one yet for this week, let me know and we'll make sure that you're on the list. So what good news, then, does the prophet Isaiah herald to the people of Israel? What will God be doing that will change their lives? I want you to listen first to these familiar words from Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That same word for the darkest valley, or the more familiar, the valley of the shadow of death, that same word is used by Isaiah in chapter 9, which we read this morning, to describe that deep darkness which the people of Israel were experiencing at the time. He addresses a people who are basically living in a pitch dark land. They were losing hope under very real threats of Assyrian domination. They faced a very uncertain future as a nation. This was a time in their history when they were on the brink of exile into Babylon, and they knew it. The previous chapter, chapter 8 of Isaiah, pictures these advancing Assyrian armies closing in on them, like a flood of the Euphrates River, which cannot be stopped. And he warns the people of Israel and Judah, prepare to be shattered. Ominous words, dark words, not your feel-good Christmassy message, I am traveling, preparing to travel with six others from our congregation to Ghana and Kenya next spring. I'm reading books by Ghanaian and Kenyan authors to get ready. Right now, I'm in the midst of a book called Homegoing by Ya Gayasi. She was born in Ghana, and she was raised in Alabama. In this work of fiction, she chronicles the story of two families over several centuries, describing rural tribal life in Ghana, the arrival of the English who capitalized on intertribal warfare and introduced the transatlantic slave trade, the mixing of races through marriage, the life of blacks sold into slavery in the United States, and then the life of blacks in coal mining towns in Alabama, and then in the urban sea of Harlem in New York City. Each chapter throughout this book is focusing on a new generation, and thankfully she gives us a little 
family tree at the very beginning so you can go back and check who she's talking about. Each chapter often describes lives that are lived in a pitch dark place. The inhumane treatment in the castle dungeons along the Cape Coast in Ghana, the dangerous coal mines of Alabama, and the agony of mental illness. In the midst of this deep darkness, again and again through her book, there are these rays of light that come in. A ray of light that brings relief, at least for a time. A child is born to a family. A new opportunity opens up for a family. An act of grace surprises us. A broken relationship is repaired back together. Light in the darkness is the good news that Isaiah offers to the people of Israel. It's the promise of light in the darkness, that change-bringing light, the light of new leadership to come, which fills them with hope. Could it really be that a child born in their midst will take over the running of the world? As the message paraphrase of this text describes the kind of authority that's going to be given to this new heir to the throne of David. He's going to take over the running of the world. Could this really be the wonderful counselor? the almighty God, the everlasting father and the prince of peace, all of that rolled into one heir of David's legacy? Could it be that the future leader that they can look forward to will rule them with justice and righteousness instead of domination and force? The message had to sound good to the people of Israel. It had to lift their hearts up out of darkness. It sounded like change was a coming. Isaiah repeats and then repeats again his focus on the joy that they can look forward to, rejoicing that will be theirs, joy like bringing in the harvest as we just celebrated here at the time of Thanksgiving. Joy like the end of a battle. Joy is multiplied, says Isaiah. It's overflowing. It's replacing the darkness, the fear, the depression. Now, Isaiah's words are very familiar to us because Christianity has seen in Isaiah's words the view of Jesus as this coming one. Not your run-of-the-mill military king, but a king who carries on David's legacy. A king backed by the God of the heavenly forces. We have long interpreted these titles that Isaiah lists as belonging to Jesus himself. That he is the promised child given to us who will have authority on his shoulders. We often read this text on the night we celebrate Jesus' birth. Remember, though, Isaiah knew nothing of Jesus. He knew nothing of his humble yet world-changing birth. He knew nothing of God intervening into the life of a particular family in a unique and very startling way. What he did know was that his neighbors, his friends, his fellow citizens needed to hear the good news that they could wait for the Lord in the midst of this pitch dark land. They could still put their hope in God. For them, life ended up staying dark for generations to come. The people were carried off against their will to live in Babylon. It did happen. The promise of light was not pegged to a time frame, however. 
It was only known to God when it would happen. And the light did not come immediately. The light shining in the darkness only came after several generations had been born and grown up in Babylon, generations who only learned about that life before exile from the stories of their grandparents and parents. The point is the promise. Light will dawn. Joy will increase. War and conflict will be burned up, transformed into fuel for a fire. What a picture of those who are getting numb to shooting. What a picture for those, those of us, who are getting numb to shootings after shootings because an individual is angry and has access to a gun getting numb to the homicide count that's flooding our city with blood and loss and fear like an overflowing Chesapeake Bay running into our streets. Light seems unrealistic, far off, maybe even impossible from where we sit in this darkness. And yet, there are places around the world where that kind of darkness simply does not exist, where access to guns is limited to hunters and police officers. Now, darkness can be in other forms as well, of course. Multiple factors can contribute to people living in darkness in various places around the world. Geography and politics play a part in whether or not hunger defines a community living in darkness. Or literal fog of pollution rests right over a city creating darkness. Pitch darkness can be found anywhere among any people. You see, we humans know what it is like to live in the umbra, the shadow, like the shadow from a total eclipse of the sun, a darkness we cannot control. So the good news of the light in the darkness continues to be a promise for us. It's the promise that God is behind it all. It's the promise that God has our back that God is a change maker, that God's zeal for us, or you could say God's commitment to us or God's love for us rules the day. That darkness doesn't last forever. It's the promise that if we keep walking, there is light on the other side of that valley of the shadow of death. And it all starts with the birth of a child who will grow up to be insistent on fair dealing and right living. It starts with good news to Israel and to us. Thanks be to God. Amen.